we discuss next a little bit about identification and construction of measures. And there's one technical thing, uh, or actually, well, two. So does a measure with uh, some properties exist? For example, this property that a measure of a box is the volume of the box, or the measure of a line is the length of the line. And, and uh, <clears throat> that's uh, one kind of general question. Another thing is that um, how can we check whether two measures are the same? So if you give me two measures, are these the, are these the same measure or are they not? Well, if you look at this, so think about mu and nu, both are measures. So they are functions from S to the extended numbers. And again, we ask, we, well, now we ask, are they the same measure? So is mu equal to nu? Well, by definition, what it means, it means mu is equal to nu. That means by definition that um, if mu of a is equal to nu of a for all a in um, the sigma algebra that we are studying. So in some sense, uh, from abstract point of view, checking if two measures are the same, well, well they are the same if and only if they, they give the same value for every set uh, in the collection uh, in the sigma algebra. Yeah. The problem is that um, what if S, quite often we work with the Borel sets of the real line, so which we usually denote by B or just or B of the R, so B Borel sets of the real line. How many Borel sets there are in on the real line? Well, of course there are infinitely many, and um, and um, and um, there are infinitely many Borel sets in the real line. And um, the thing is that. Um, um, it's it's hard to kind of describe every Borel set. So there's a no nice description, okay, that this is a Borel set if and only if that. So checking this if, if mu and nu are equal for every Borel set in the world is kind of an impossible task in practice. You cannot, uh, you cannot kind of enumerate Borel sets with any numerical software, you cannot, like, there's no way of that. So it's, a, it's a, actually a difficult problem in practice. And that's why we, we need to do a bit of analysis and think, okay, is there some convenient way of doing this? And um, the answer is yes. So we, uh, we have a study. Uh, this is a topic uh, studied by Eugene Dinkin, um, a famous Russian mathematician who, um, who well, he passed away. I, it was, uh, I checked in Wikipedia, so he was still alive a couple of years ago, but now he passed away in 2014. So he did a long career originally from St. Petersburg, but he migrated to the USA and um, Dinkin uh, made a long career in, in, in Cornell. So he made big contributions to both algebra and probability theory. and um, and we'll we'll see now the kind of key Dinkins uh, result for for basic probability. So Dinkins um, kind of big result was this. We all first define so-called pi system, and pi system we define that it's a collection of sets, um, a little bit like sigma algebra, but a little bit less requirement. So. Pi system is a collection of sets such that uh, if we take two sets in the system, so then the intersection is there as well. So it's very simple thing, just something closed under intersection, okay, or closed under finite intersections. That's what a pi system is. And um, let's think about, can you give me an example of a pi system? So do pi systems exist? What do you think about the power set? If you take two sets from the power set and you take their intersection, is that also in the power set? 
Yes, of course, because the power set contains every set. So we know that power sets are pi systems. But actually, we also know that uh, if you think of any sigma algebra, we know that sigma algebras are closed under countable unions and they are also closed under countable intersections. So then they are also closed under finite unions and finite intersections. That means that actually every pi system is a sigma algebra as well. And that is what, uh, what the lecture notes also tells us here. So every pi system is also... Uh, no, no, no. I was underlying the wrong thing. Any sigma algebra is a pi system, trivial, yeah. Okay, the other way is it's not true. <clears throat> uh, but um, let's see, an important pi system is, um, is the one defined here. Let's look at the pi system defined by the intervals um, from my, minus infinity up to x, including x. <clears throat> so if you take an intersection of these, so if you draw a picture, it's clear. So let's take uh, one interval up to x here. And then let's take another interval of this form up to y. And they, they kind of continue up to minus infinity. So if you look at the intersection of uh, this, uh, let's say this is A and this is B, what's the intersection A and B? So then it's the set of points contained in both of these intervals. So that the intersection actually turn, turns out to be of the same form, you see. A intersection of B is the, actually the interval up to X minimum Y. So sometimes I'm denoting X uh, minimum Y in this way. So that's why if you take two intersections, the intersection is also in this um, collection. So it is a pi system. And this is a very important pi system. It's very simple, but it's very important because what we know, it's a proposition um, very briefly discussed in the previous lecture. This is a pi system which generates the Borel sigma algebra on the real line. So this pi system generates the same sigma algebra as would generate uh, pi, uh, all the open sets. And uh, <clears throat> okay, now we'll get to the main theorem of Dinkin. And here it is, let's put it there. Dinkin's uh, identification theorem, what does it say? It says that if we take two probability measures, P1 and P2. So think about that somebody gave you two probability measures, P1 and P2. And somebody asks, okay, are they the same measure or are they a different measure? And, um, and, and the answer is that, okay, uh, it's hard to look all the measurable sets and, and look at the values. But we assume that we, we have found a pi system J such that pi system generates the full sigma algebra. So <clears throat> what we are assuming, we assume that the J, J is um, generating pi system. for um, the full sigma algebra, which is denoted by F in this case. So assume that we can find a, any generating pi system for the full sigma algebra, then the following are equivalent. There is um, property one, which says that uh, these probability measures agree on the pi system and property two, they are equal. So they agree everywhere. And we know that uh, two implies one is of course trivial. So if P1 is equal to P2, so then it means that these probability measures agree on every set. So then they of course agree on the pi system. So this is trivial, <clears throat> but um, the fact that one implies two that's the kind of uh, Dinkin's theorem. Okay. 
So it's extremely useful in practice. You want to study probability measures, are they the same or not? You only need to work on a pi system and to see if they agree there. Let's see how to apply this, theor apply this theorem first before we discuss the proof. How do we apply this? Well, we can apply it to work with cumulative distribution functions. So the cumulative distribution function is of course the familiar thing. So if we have a measure new, the cumulative distribution function of new is defined by the measure of the this interval minus infinity up to and including x. And uh, <clears throat> what Dinkin's theorem implies is that um, if we take any two probability measures on the real line now and with the Borel sets and we have cumulative distribution functions f1 and f2. So then the following are equivalent the cumulative distribution functions are equal or the measures are equal. So it's the same thing. And uh, how is this corollary proved? The non-trivial part is the implication that one implies two. So let's look at it. Um, so we assume that these cumulative distribution functions are equal. So that means that they agree at every point X. Then we take the pi system j to be the one where which contains every set of the form minus infinity up to x. So in that case, it follows that the measure of new one of the any set of this form is equal to the cumulative distribution function. These cumulative distribution functions they agree in every point. So that means that new one agrees with new two in every set in the pi system. Yeah. So they coincide, coincide on, on the pi system. And then we know that this, uh, this pi system J that we look here by proposition uh, 1.11.1, it, um, it generates the Borel sigma algebra. So it is a generating pi system for the Borel sigma algebra. That's why from Dinkin's theorem, it follows that uh, P1 is equal to P2. And, and this is the kind of how Dinkin's, Dinkin's theorem is applied to conclude that um, whenever we work on a probability measures on the real line. So, and that's what we quite often do. When we, whenever you work with random variables, any random variables on the real line, they may have a density or may not have a density. They could be like a Dirac measure. They could be like a Gaussian distribution or exponential distribution, or they could be a discrete, like let's say Bernoulli binomial. They are on the real line. So we have lots of different measures on the real line and different random variables to, to kind of identify them. Are they, do they have the same distribution or not? So we look at the associated probability distributions. That means the measures. Uh, the measures equal or not. By this theorem, the measures are equal or not equal if and only if the corresponding cumulative distribution functions are equal or not equal. Okay. Um, that's the corollary. What about the theorem? So how to prove Dinkin's theorem? Well, the proof is not super hard. It's quite abstract, but um, it's not super hard, let me say so. Um, but we only have two minutes left before we need to stop. So that's the problem. And I think that's the problem with, uh, with the order of the lecture notes. So also, Kutela thought that uh, maybe there's no time to do all the proofs, that's why the proof of this is left in the appendix. So if you want to look at the proof, we need to go to the appendix. It's not long and it's not super difficult. So if you have a time, if you have a spare time, so it's maybe a fun read, but um, if you're busy, it's fine to skip. So this is not required in the exam. If you want to look at this proof, so it's based on so-called D system and um, 
it's just that there's a little bit uh, lots of terminology. So D system, it's D for dinking. And let me say that it's also called in, in some other books, let's say the Kallenbergis book, so it's called a lambda system. Why is it called the pi system and lambda system? The reason is that when Dinkin was writing his original paper, so when you write the paper, you usually, when I write the paper, I'm not uh, calling things like Leskela system or Leskela function, but um, I might call them something with not my name. So that was that's what Dinkin did as well. So Dinkin didn't call his own system Dinkin system, but he called it Lambda system. Okay. And uh, then some other authors who were so impressed about Dinkin's work, they thought, okay, instead of Lambda, we should call it, name it after Dinkin. So they started calling it uh, D system. Okay. In Wikipedia, it's called Dinkin system. Or what is this system? It is a system with these three properties here uh, down there. So it's almost like a sigma algebra again, but it's not exactly a sigma algebra. So it contains the full sets. It's closed under um, uh, set differences and it's closed under monotone limits. So it's kind of a um, sigma algebra type of thing, but it's not. Every sigma algebra is a D system, but not vice versa. And uh, with these D systems, you can do one lemma, kind of generated uh, D systems as, as you do with generated uh, sigma algebras. And, uh, and then you can prove this uh, thinking theorem, which is there. So it's kind of a two pages of thinking and playing with these systems and sigma algebras, algebras and generating things. So um, it's rather complicated anyway. So maybe if you are busy, so you can save time and skip this proof. But it is there if you like to read it. <laughs>